Look at your notes with me. We're going to be talking about an unshakable allegiance. Unshakable allegiance. But first, let me give you a funny story to introduce it. Uh, this husband was dying of an unknown uh, disease, and the doctor can't even figure it out, but he's on his last leg. I mean, he's last hour or two. And he calls for his wife and says, honey, you got to come up here. i got to confess. i got to confess some things. She says, shh, it's okay. It's okay. She sits down beside him. He says, no, i got to get this off my chest. Listen, listen, I've been gambling. We have no savings left. I'm so sorry. She says, shh, it's okay. And he said, no, no, no. And then I stole your jewelry and I pawned all of that for more money so I could gamble. She said, shh, it's all right. It's all right. He said, no, that's not the worst of it. He said, for the last couple of years, I've been carrying on with your best friend, Betty. She said, shh, it's all right. I know, I know. He said, no, you don't. And, and I took some of the money that I took from your jewelry. And you know when I said I was gone on, gone on a business trip? No, Betty and I were in Acapulco together spending all your money. She said, shh, I know, I know. He says, you knew? She says, yes, I've known all along. He said, what, you knew? Yes, she said, why do you think I poisoned you? <laughs> So you got to be careful of those women. <laughs> well, today we're going to talk about a man who had an, as interesting a wife, and his name was Job. Now, Job has all of his stuff taken away from him. He loses his family. He loses his finances. He loses everything, his whole farm. And then the enemy attacks him, and he breaks out and boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And his wife said, well, after all, all the kids are gone, right? And the family's gone, and, and the farm is gone, and finances are, are gone. She said, why, why don't you just curse God and die? Very interesting wife, huh? Well, instead of capitulating to that, he makes an uncanny allegiance to his faith. And he says, nope, not going to do it. And this guy must be one of the pillars of faith. We're going to read about it. So if you would take out your notes and let's read it, it'll come up on the board as well, nice and loudly, as we are introduced to Job and his wife. Would you read it with me? Go. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Now his wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Just curse God and die. And Job replied, shall we accept only good from God and not trouble? In all of this, Job did not sin in what he said. What a man of faith. Unshakable, unflappable Job. And a little while later, he goes even further with his pledge of allegiance to God and says, even though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And I thought, you are amazing. But then you know what I realized? Then for the rest of the book, after he makes these pledges to God, the rest of the book, 40 chapters, he's doubting God, mad at God, calling God a tormentor and a terrorist, he is mad at his friends. He curses the day of his birthday. He curses the doctor that delivered him. He curses even the guys that bought cigars to celebrate his birthday. He is done. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. You just made this amazing declaration. He even said to God, would you stop tormenting me? It's, it's like I'm your enemy. And I've been reading this through the book of Job, 40 chapters of wrestling with his faith, one who made such a declaration of allegiance, and now he's doubting everything. You know, it reminds me of us. When we came to Christ, we made a pledge of allegiance to God. We said, God, we trust you with our life and everything I have is yours. And now we struggle with doubts. We stutter, we fall, we fail, we run into to walls. We have a tough time forgiving people. How many of you could say, that's me too? Would you raise your hand? Yeah, yeah, we all are like that. And we, we struggle with that. So the question is, can we really make an unshakable allegiance to God? The answer is yes. You can put your trust in God without reservation 
But let me remind you, you will still have reservations. See, the distance between declaration and transformation can be miles apart. It can take a lifetime to get to this. Our talk is not always our walk, and what we profess is yet to be possessed. We still have to get a hold of it. We still have to apprehend that. So you say, well, how do you navigate the in-between? Because I've made a declaration of God, but there's still not a transformation. I'm still wrestling with stuff. It's still hard to forgive. I still get upset. I still want to bail out, just like Job. But today I want to give you an encouragement as well as a challenge. Because in between could be a lifetime, miles apart. But it doesn't mean the declaration was wrong. The declaration is correct. But now you live in the land in between where we have to work out our salvation to the point of transformation. From being informed about God to being transformed by God. There's some wrestling that takes place. You see, the Pharisees were informed, but they never got transformed. They got stuck in between. That's why God said to the disciples, do what they say, but don't do what they do. See, they were informed, but never transformed. Because they felt knowledge about God was good enough. And the Lord says, oh, no, no, you'll get stuck in between. I have a friend that's a redneck guy, and uh, I, I used to hire myself out in the summers to different uh, farms and ranches. And one summer I was in Montana and we were doing some ranching and he's kind of like a cook. And I love the sayings of the rednecks, you know, they talk with an accent like this. And, and they, he's so funny, he said, you done it yet? I said, what? He said, you done it yet? I said, done it yet? I said, oh, have I eaten yet? I said, whatever. He said, you done it? I said, no, I haven't done it. He said, well, sit your little buns down and I'll give you something. And I thought, well, thank you for calling them little. And uh, so I, I sat down and he gives me these two biscuits and they're just flat as pancakes and hard as a brick. They're like hockey pucks. And I take a bite and about broke my tooth. I said, what in the world is this? He said, yeah, he said, I know. He said, my grandma used to make biscuits that was so fluffy, it would compete with, with, a, uh, with Peter Cottontail. It was so fluffy. He said, but when I make my biscuits, they put them in the oven, and they squat to rise, and then they get stuck in the squat. <laughs> and I, thought, I said, these got stuck in the squat, all right. He said, yeah, they did. <laughs> and I thought, you know, a lot of Christians are like that. We squat to rise and we get stuck in the squat. <laughs> and we live our whole life in between, just stuck in the squat. And I thought, God, how do we get out of that? How do we get out of that? Well, did you know that since Easter, over 400 people have received Christ for the first time in New Hope West? <laughs> And so many of them, if you're one of them, many of them have asked, well, what are the steps to growth, to being transformed? Because we made the declaration, but we're a long way from, being, from the transformation. Uh, how do we go from being informed to being transformed? Uh, what are some of the steps to get from our talk to our, our walk? I said, well, you have a desire to grow, don't you? He said, yeah, but there's such a tension because I ain't there yet. I said, congratulations, because Paul the Apostle had the same tension. What? Yep. So it's not wrong. Well, shouldn't I maybe not have made that declaration of Christ? No, no, no. You got to make that. But there's a journey where the Bible says you must work out your own salvation. And there's steps in between. Well, what are those steps? He said, well, see, Paul had the same heart. Let's hear what Paul had to say. He had to live with that tension, but that tension is good because like a bow, if it pulls one way, it's going to go further the other way. And don't be afraid of that tension because it's going to mobilize you. It's going to give you impulsion to move forward. Paul the Apostle said that. Let's read. He, in his own words, he says this. Would you read it on the board? Go. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things, but I press on to possess that perfection 
for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on. Some of you are in the in-between. Don't get stuck in the squat. But God is going to perfect you, refine you. And that may take 40 chapters. But don't ever be discouraged. Paul the Apostle had the same tension and it moved him forward. Paul the Apostle said it this way. He said, forgetting what lies behind. You might say, you know, but you know what I did last week and I messed up two weeks ago and, and I, I fell back or I did this or I did that. Listen, always remember when you come to Christ, always anchor your life, not to your past, anchor your life to your future because it will pull you forward, not pull you back. Anchor your life to your future. God does that. It was told of Beethoven when he was in his 30s, he actually lost his hearing. Do you know that? The great composer. He would compose amazing symphonies. And, and towards the end of his life, he died young. Towards the end of his life, uh, his piano or his harpsichord was sorely out of tune because he couldn't hear. And so he'd be playing music and it was like, oh, so dissonant, discordant. But he would write compositions and then sit and play and tears would be rolling down his face. Why? To a listening ear, it would sound terrible. But to Beethoven, he wasn't hearing the music the piano made. He was hearing the music the piano should make. And God is the same way with you. Even though you and I may have a stutter step, God still sees you as someone pressing forward if you're anchoring your life to your future, not to your past. Because then we'll get over this. If I've got a rock on an end of a string and I'm pulling it this way, even though it hits a speed bump, it keeps pressing on. If I'm in the back and saying, go forward, it's not going to go forward. But the string is pulling it forward. And the same is true. The Holy Spirit is moving you forward. You're going to hit some speed bumps. You're going to wrestle with reservations and doubts. But that tension is very important. Never begrudge the the tension of the Holy Spirit that's moving you from glory to glory into his likeness. So you say, well, what are the steps from going from information to transformation? Well, what are the steps in between? Let me give you three steps that'll take us from one to the next. Are you ready? Here it is. Write it down some place. Step one, start by getting to know God. Do everything you can to get to know God. And that's why daily devotions are so incredibly important. I want to encourage you, if you don't, start today. Go get a journal and start. Start there in the front. There's a journal reading program that's for children, for intermediate people, for advanced. And you can use one of them. And some people say to me, Wayne, but what if I don't understand 90% of what I'm reading? I said, that's okay. Don't journal on the 90%. Journal on the 10% you do. Because you see, if you just throw everything out because you don't understand 90% and you neglect the 10% you do understand, then if you don't do anything, then why should God show you any more? Because if you're not faithful in little that he shows you, why should he show you any more? You'll be unfaithful in much. But if you say, well, I understood that verse, great. Journal on that verse. Start with what you understand. And then next week, he'll give you 10% understanding, then 15, then 20. Because God says, if you're faithful in little, you'll be faithful in. And watch for Jesus. He's going to be speaking to you. The word of God is inspired. And so the Lord's going to speak to your heart. Don't look for verses that back up your political views or back up the way you think or the vices that you have to give you permission or endorse the vices that you might have. No, no, no. Look for Jesus. Look for what he says, what he thinks, and then allow your heart to be transformed. That's that movement from information to transformation. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, were looking for ways to increase their bias from the scriptures to give them a little bit more power or authority, a little more bolstering because they can say, well, God said when God didn't say. And Jesus says something very interesting. He says, don't look for stuff in the scripture that makes your life more convenient. 
gives you more life and gives you more pizzazz. No, no. In fact, he said it this way. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. But it is these that testify about me. He says, look for things in the church, in the Bible that speak about Jesus and hang out with him. Don't look for stuff to just increase your bias. And that happens so much. We have to be careful. Look for Jesus. Otherwise, we'll be like the Pharisees. Did you know the Pharisees of long ago, you could tell who they were because they dressed in a certain way? Today, you can't tell. Why? Because the Pharisees look just like us, inside of every single one of us, is a Pharisee just waiting to grow up. And so we must be cautious of that and make sure that our hearts are in the right place so that as we grow, we will grow correctly. And by the way, can I commend you? Because you have taken time out on the weekends to be in a church where you're learning about God. And, you know, by the way, the traditions in America's families are basically, traditions have gone the way of the buffalo. If you think about it, it used to be where families would all come together for dinner. They'd all come together, at least at Thanksgiving, wherever you were in the world, they'd come together for Thanksgiving. That's a tradition, isn't that right? Or at Christmas, you got to come together for Christmas. And, uh, but no more. No, it's gone. Uh, it, it's gone the way of buff, the buffalo. But one of the best traditions that we can establish, especially if you're a parent of a new family, establish the tradition of Sunday morning we all go to church. That would be one of the last traditions in America. Say, no, 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 we're going to go to church. You get up and we're going to go to church and make it a tradition. That's just what I do. And here you will hear about Christ. So make it a great tradition. Now, I understand if you're going to a church that's no good, that's one thing. But in my unbiased, impartial, objective opinion, you're in one good church, folks. Huh? You found a good church. So make it a tradition. Some people, by the way, this is just an, an aside, they say, hey, do we sign a membership card? Well, let me give you three steps to discern whether or not this is your home church. Number one, when you come, the Holy Spirit will confirm to your heart, this is home. Amen. You've come home. Number two, you must ask yourself, am I your pastor? You see, because if I'm not your pastor, you're going to kind of take certain things and circumvent the rest. It'll be a Reader's Digest edition of the Bible, and it's going to, you know, based on you. But you've got to give somebody permission to speak into your life spiritually. And so if it's not here, then it's somewhere else. Well, I want you to go there and be there because you must give someone permission to spiritually speak into your life. So is he my pastor? And then the third is, is this. Do I hear Jesus there? Can Jesus speak to my heart? Is it sometimes, can I look around and say, I don't know what everybody else is doing here, but this is for me. If that's yes, yes, and yes, then this is your home church because signing a membership card doesn't answer those three questions. You must. And once you answer those three questions, you signed that card. So go from it that way. The scripture says it this way in Ephesians chapter four. He says, for he is given to the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, and shepherd and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry for the building up of the body of Christ. Now, he says he's given pastors to the equipping of the saints in order to do the ministry. So that word equipping the saints is equipping you. That pastor is to equip you. That word equipping is a Greek word, kartatismon. You want to try and say that? It's a Greek word. Try it, kartatismon. Good. That means to mend or to equip. You remember in the Gospels, it says James and John, sons of Zebedee, were in their boats mending their nets on the Sea of Galilee. Well, that word mending their nets is the word kartatismo. Same as equipping. Because you see, in those days, they would throw their nets out into the Sea of Galilee and inadvertently, in trying and attempting to catch fish, it would get snagged on the rocks below. And when they pull it up to release it, it would tear the net. So the fish would go out, and there's a gaping hole in the net. 
So they would then mend their nets or cartatismon their nets. But the reason the nets were mended wasn't so that they can brag about how many nets they have mended, how many cool appointments they have to mend nets. No, no, no. They mended the nets to do what? In order to what? Throw them back in the, in the sea to catch more fish. Now listen carefully. You will come here to Sunday mornings and there will be times that you will come with a gaping hole in your heart. A gaping tear in your soul. And something from the word of God will heal you. And you'll say, oh, I got it. Whew, boy, that really helps. And you'll leave here whole and healed. And that's what the word of God does. But it not only does that, it actually then equips you for further service. It gives you strength to carry on and to do what God wants you to do, what he created you and me to do. So you will come and you'll be mended, and I'm glad for that, but God's going to throw you back out in order to catch fish. And so these times are incredibly important for mending and for strengthening. And if this is your home church, that will happen again and again and again but you're going to be mended in order to do. And so your next step is, would you write down step one is to learn as much as you can about God, know him. The second is now start doing what you know. What God has given to you, you know about God, knowledge of God. Now do something with it. In fact, the Bible says it this way. Would you read it with me in John 13, 17? Ready? Go. Now that you... Say it nice and loud. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you... Do. Yeah, if you know these things, you'll be blessed if you... Do. So the blessing doesn't come from the knowing. You'll be blessed if you... Do. Watch this. If this is all that you know, and you're a brand new believer, and you go, whoa, that's it, and you do everything you know, you have applied 100% of what you know. Time goes on, and you increase your knowledge of God, but you only still do the same thing, the same amount. Now you're like applying 50%. A little while later, you go to a men's thing, you go to a women's Bible study, you go to summer camp. Whoa, now you know a lot. But you go home and you still do the same thing. Which one of these does the blessings come through? The knowing or the doing? It comes through this, the doing. And you say, well, how come God doesn't bless me more? I know so much. It's because you are blessed if you know them? No, you're blessed if you... So the second step, the first is know, know God. Get to know God. And your daily devotions, your times here, your studies, whatever it might be, you'll get to know God in a tremendous way. It'll grow. But the second step is you've got to match this to this and start growing because the blessings come through this right here. So then if you know a ton and you start doing more, the blessings increase because it comes through the doing, not the knowing. And that's when information becomes transformation. The Pharisees only had more information. So if, if the word of God just comes into your brain, hmm, that's rational, hmm, that's spiritual, hmm, that's very good, I, I agree with that. If it just comes here, it's called information. If it drops down here and you get excited about it, whoo, 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 that's called inspiration, whoo. But it's not until it gets into your shoes and bleeds out of your toenails that it becomes transformation. And that's that long distance between declaration and transformation that goes through a process. Get to know God and then start to do what you know. Because if it's just information, that makes you a Pharisee. If it's just, whoo, inspiration makes you a fanatic. 
But when it comes bleeding out your toes, it makes you a disciple. And that's where we want to get to. So from declaration to transformation, it's going to take a while from what you profess and what you actually possess. It's going to take 40 chapters. Just don't get stuck in the squat. And so keep learning. Continue to grow in him. Well, you say, well, how do you do that? Because I need reminders. Yeah, I do too. I would encourage you to put up some, like this. See this little wristband? This has been on since that one sermon about me and my big mouth. And I do one thing because I have a big mouth sometimes. And so I just keep this on to just remind me to shut up. <laughs> just don't say anything. Yeah, yeah, no, don't say anything. It just, it's one thing, just remind. The Jewish people had festivals, they had feast days. They have something on their doorposts called a mezuzah. In it is a little teeny scripture of Deuteronomy 6. And it, as they enter their house and they go out of their house, they touch that. You know why? To remind them to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Maybe you need a scripture on the wall that just says, Peace, be still today from last week's message. Give your, how many of you need reminders? Raise your hand. How many of you need reminders? Yeah, good. Yeah, the rest of you that didn't raise your hand, you need a reminder. That's your... <laughs> we need... And, and work on just one thing at a time because you say, Wayne, doing... I mean, I, I can't do a ton of stuff. Do one thing. One thing. Just one. Work on one thing. For me, it's watch what I say. Just be a little more quiet. What you want to say, just, just chill. Just don't do it. And so I kind of watch myself. I'm just working on one thing. Maybe this summer it might be devotions. Try to do it. Can't do it seven days a week. Do it three days a week. Just one thing. Right after World War II, Dr. W. Edward, Edward Demings is his name, Dr. W. Edwards Deming, I was assigned by MacArthur to go into Japan because Japan's economy had collapsed after World War II. And he went in there and studied the businesses and, because in those days, if you turned something over, a toy or an implement, and it said made in Japan, what did that mean? Yeah, it was junk. Not today, though. So he went in there and gave them some principles, one of which was this. If you will improve something, one thing, about yourself and your product every day, just one little thing, maybe the way you write, the penmanship with which you write, uh, the, the recording of something, milling a, a, the metal that you're working with, just another nanometer better to get it balanced. If you'll improve just one thing about yourself and your product every day, he said, and this was a promise, he said, in 10 years, you will have turned around your economy of Japan, and in 30 years, you will be a world power economically. Well, this was a huge, huge promise to have made, but they bought it hook, line, and sinker. And so they began to do that. Even till this day, you'll go to the Japanese companies and they have everybody, all their employees do exercise in the morning. They line them up and you do stretches before you go to work. They'll do all kinds. Toyota, who was making pistons for Honda, would mill that piston uh, or a piston ring just a little bit better. They would increase the balance just a little bit better. They would increase and they would improve and they would increase and improve and sure enough, in 10 years, the whole economy of Japan had turned around a, a nation with zero natural resources. They turned the economy around and 30 years later, they became a world power economically by improving stuff. Think about it. You take a look at uh, our stock market. Much of our stock market is owned by Japan. You see all the 7-Elevens coming up? It's not owned by the U.S. Japan owns 7-Eleven. They will take our cars. That was developed by Henry Ford, an American. They take our cars, they improve them, sell it back to us at three times the price. <laughs> and we buy them. How many of you own a Japanese car, like a Lexus or an Acura? Or, yeah, yeah, a bunch of us. Yeah. And so we see, oh, yeah. In fact, a lot of the, I found out that my tractor's engine is made by Japan. John Deere. They own so much stuff. Why? Because they took our engines, improved them, sold them back to us. Pretty smart. 
They have become a world power economically. They take our cameras that Kodak made, they will improve them and sell it back to us at 10 times the price, a Canon or a Sony camera. They own our movie theaters and our cinema production companies because they improve it and sell it back to us. They take our computers, they take everything and improve it. All because one of our people told them what to do. Shame on that man. <laughs> Now listen, if Japan can do that for an economy, how much more can we improve ourselves for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? If you improve something about yourself, just 1% a day, just 1%, in a year you will have improved yourself over 365%. Pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, improve something, you know? Comb your hair, put on deodorant, tie your shoes, anything. <laughs> And you'll be surprised how the improvement will affect and benefit those all around you. So do what you know. In fact, even in the Old Testament, the Lord says, don't drive out your enemies all at once. Let me read it for you. He says this, little by little, I will drive them out before you until you have increased enough to take possession of the land. Little by little. What's one thing you're going to work on this week? One thing. When I was... Uh, in college, uh, I used to practice a club soccer in Hayward, at Hayward Field, which is now the home of the pre-Olympic trials, and uh, it's now a multi-million dollar stadium. But in those days, anybody could just go in, and in the middle of the track, uh, we would practice soccer. And on one end, I was watching a high jumper practice for the Olympic trials. And it was another year away, but he would start off with a bar at about four feet, and he would jump that, and then they would raise it and raise it and raise it. Well, over a year, I'd watch him every week as I would practice soccer. Well, finally, the day of the Olympic trials came, and I didn't even know this guy, but I wanted to go see him compete. So I actually went to the trials. I don't know who this guy is. I just, I just been watching him. Well, the bar is now up at 6'4". 6'4", about right here. <laughs> That's tall. <laughs> and, and everybody knocked it down except this guy. He had three chances. First one, he knocked it down. Second one, he knocked it down again. So we're going, come on, come on. You can win this thing. Just one jump. And he would consult and confer with his coach. And then he looked at that bar for a moment as if to make a deal with it. And then he started his long semicircular run. And as he approached that bar, Hey, you could see his feet like a gated horse start to pump. And right at the end, he just catapulted into the air. And he went over with the tilt of his head, the arch of his back, and just the flick of his foot was at the right time. And he came down and cleared the bar. I started crying. I thought, this is amazing. I ran down there. I said, I don't know you, but can I hug you? <laughs> and I was thinking, you know, when he was jumping at four feet, he had 6'4 inside of him. He just proved it. But he had to get that 6'4 out of him. How did he do that? Did he raise the bar a foot at a time? No, six inches at a time. Two feet at a time. No, in order to get that 6'4 out of him, he had, to raise, he had to raise the bar about what? An inch at a time. Again and again. Listen, some of you are jumping two feet one inch right now. And you go, whoa, nobody else is doing that. And the Lord is saying, there's 6'4 inside of this church. There's 6'8 in this church. There's 7'2 in this church. But you're settling for four feet. And the Lord is saying, if you will increase who you are and what you do, just an inch, just 1% a day, for the sake of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, maybe the way you speak, Maybe the way you greet people, maybe breaking through your shyness and saying, hi, I am introducing just one little thing. If you'll do that for the sake of the kingdom of God, you'll move from information to transformation and you won't get stuck in the squat. Begin to move because the blessings come through the doing, not the knowing. And then would you write down number three? After you know about God, and then you start to do what you know, don't ever give up. 
don't give up. Because it's going to take 40 chapters for some of us. And you're going to have setbacks and doubts and reservations. Remember, even though you make an allegiance to God without reservation, it doesn't mean you won't have reservations. Yeah, because I have doubts along the way. Sure you will. But listen carefully. Here's a tip. When you get doubts about God, here it is. Doubt your doubts before you doubt your faith. <laughs> doubt your doubts before you doubt your faith. How many of us are so easily... Uh, uh, we're so easily jettisoned out of the race. Well, that's what they're going to think. Well, that, forget it. Well, that does, sounds dumb. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not coming back to this church. It's so like, stop, stop. Doubt your doubt before you doubt your faith. Others will say, Wayne, you know, I, I'd like to give up. Why? Because I made a declaration for God here, and then now everything is still weeds in my life. Still coming up bad fruit. I said, well, I'll tell you why. Why? Because let's take, just imagine you have a bag of bad seed full of weeds and thistle seeds. That's all you're doing is throwing out bad stuff. Anger, lust, avarice, greed, selfishness, pride, narcissism, whatever it might be. You're throwing all of this stuff all over the place. And all of a sudden you come to New Hope West, boom, you receive Christ. You exchange bad seed for eternal seed. Everybody got it? Now you start throwing eternal seed, but what's still coming up? Bad stuff, weeds. Why? Because you've been throwing that for years. And you say, well, I've been throwing good seed, nothing but bad's coming up. I'm out of here. Like, stop, don't give up. Don't stop. You keep throwing good seed. And there will come a time when your declaration will turn to transformation. You keep throwing good seed. Don't stop. Don't say, well, forget it then. If, I, if, if it's going to be bad stuff coming up, I might as well throw bad stuff again. Like, no, 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 no. Don't stop. Don't stop. Because ye have need of endurance, for after you have done the will of God, you will receive what was promised. Hebrews. You keep going. Doesn't matter what comes up. I'm going to stay with God. I'm going to stay faithful. I'm going to stay true to my allegiance to God. And all of a sudden, all of that becomes behind you, and now wonderful things are starting to happen. It's going to require maybe 40 chapters. It's okay. Just don't get stuck in the squat. Keep going. So know all you can about God, and then start to do what you know, even if it's 1% at a time. And then don't stop. Don't stop. You keep going. Why? Because Jesus is going to walk with you every step of the way. And he's going to assign someone called a paraclete, the Holy Spirit, to walk alongside of you and guide you. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit who's been assigned to you. He knows. So keep going. All you got to do is keep going. Let me uh, finish with a story. It's a true story of uh, one of the greatest concert pianists of all time. His name was Jean Paderewski. Ignace Jean Paderewski from Poland, and uh, this mother had a little seven-year-old boy taking piano lessons. Oh, he abhorred them. He wanted to go out and play with his friends, but it was time for him to practice piano. And he'd say, I don't want to practice piano. And the mother said, practice piano. Well, it just happened that the great concert pianist, Paderewski, was coming to town in a concert. So, so she thought maybe if he went to this concert and heard this maestro, maybe it would inspire him to play piano. So she bought tickets, quite expensive, and she went there with her son, who was, who was antsy. And he, had, he was full of energy, and he was getting up his seat, down from his seat, up from his seat, down from his seat, and the concert wasn't going to start for another 10 minutes. But when's this going to start, Mom? She said, just in a little while, up on the stage under a pin spotlight, it was a beautiful ebony black Steinway grand piano with a tufted chair waiting for the master to come out. But while the people were waiting, this little boy got antsier and antsier. Well, the mom turned to talk to a friend, but when she turned around, her kid was gone. He had escaped. She looked around in horror thinking, where is he? And to her greater horror, when she looked up, he was climbing up the stairs to the piano. 
And then worst of all, he situates himself on that stool and starts to play the only song he knows, Chopsticks. And he starts playing Chopsticks. Now the mother does not know what to do. She's looking around going, oh no. And other people are looking around thinking, whose kid is this? And I could see the mother going, I have no idea whose kid this is. Well, the master, Paderewski himself from off stage, heard the commotion. And the story is told that he quickly, without hesitation, put on his coat with tails and slid out into the, the audience, I mean, into the, onto the stage. And, and he put one hand on one side of the boy and the other hand on the other. And he whispered to the boy, just don't stop. And he kept playing. Chopsticks. And with his left hand, Paderewski would fill in the bass notes. And then with his right hand, he started putting in arpeggios that would make that sound like a heart just going back and forth. And, and that little boy just kept playing chopsticks. And his eyes were big, and he kept saying, just don't stop. Just don't, whatever happens, don't stop. In a moment, it crescendoed and it ended to a standing ovation of the people. And I think back and I thought, you know, the master turned a mistake into a miracle. Not because the little boy was so good, but because the master was there to augment that little boy. The master is there to augment you and me. Just don't stop. Do what you can. Know about God and know Him with all your heart. Press in. There's going to be a tension, but it'll be pulling you forward from information to transformation. And then begin to do what you know because the blessings come through not the knowing, but the doing. And then whatever happens, don't stop because the Holy Spirit is there to turn our mistakes into an enchanting, unforgettable, Symphony. Can you say amen to that? Let's stand together. We will end with a prayer. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, please pray this prayer with all your heart because he's the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. And if you miss him, we've missed it all. It's a very simple prayer. But I'm gonna ask you, if you've never received Christ, pray this. If it's your first time, then when you leave, there will be a yes packet that an usher will have. Would you ask them for one? Just say, could I get a yes packet? In it, some material that'll help you so much in your first few steps with Christ. And if you need prayer in any way, there will be prayer counselors here to my left and to your right. Please access them immediately after the service. They'll pray for you, love you, help you in any way that they can. But would you bow your heads with me and let's pray this concluding prayer. Would you pray this after me? Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you that you came and you died for my sins that I might have life everlasting. Change me. Make me the person you want me to be. I turn from my sins and I turn to you and receive you as my Lord and Savior. And now I say this so everyone can hear, so you can hear me, so I can hear myself, and so the devil can hear, Jesus Christ is my Lord. He is my Savior. I belong to him. In Jesus' name I pray. Father, that's a cry of our heart. Thank you for receiving us to yourself. As long as it takes, we will follow you. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone says, Amen, amen and amen and amen. Seal that with a clap offering, would you?